church and our online family and friends. Thank you once again for joining us on this day after the election. We appreciate you joining in with us. Please click the share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight will come from Hebrews 13, 5b through 6a. That's Hebrews 13, 5b through 6a. And it reads, For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. 6a says, So we can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. The Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. In the words of Susan Wallace from South Haven, Mississippi, she says, we may be concerned or anxious about the results of the elections. And I know that some of you all are. But let us stand firm on the promises of God. God is the same today as he was yesterday. As long as we put all of our trust in God, we are safe from any attacks of this dark world. And she goes on to say that God is a promise keeper. We know that God has proven himself over and over again. And we thank God for his everlasting love. So we do not fear the future because God has the future in his hands. So let us look back on all God has done for us and give him the praise and honor that is due his name. And since I know God as a promise keeper, I'm going to trust in the Lord until I die. I can't trust in the world. I can't trust in the presidency. I am going to put my trust in the Lord until I die. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on my bended knees. I'm going to watch, fight, and pray. I'm going to trust in the Lord until I die. Help us sing the song, I Will Trust in the Lord. trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I
Thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, again for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to come this far and to honor you, Father God. We thank you now for blessing us. We thank you for giving us another chance. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us with another privilege of honoring you. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we study your word. Forgive us for our sins that nothing will hinder us from hearing from you. Bless us, Lord, tonight that as we study your word, that you will reveal yourself unto us and remind us who Jesus is and who what Jesus has already done for us. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus the Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. I will trust in the Lord until I die. Until I die, until I die. I will trust in the Lord. Yes, I will. I will trust. I'm gonna trust him. Will you trust him? I'm going to trust in the Lord until I die. Trust in the Lord until I die. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. Will you trust him? Will you continue to trust him in these terrible times that we live in? Let me look at uh, Colossians again. Colossians chapter 2 is where we are. We look to finish up chapter 2 on tonight. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 20 through 23. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23 is where we are tonight. Let me thank those who are listening by way of live broadcast. Thank you for being a part of our service on tonight. Thank you to our visitors for joining us again here at the New Beginning Church from our remote location. Thank you for being a part of our service on tonight. Thank you for joining us. It's a good time to be with the Lord. It's a good time to focus on him. It's a good time to be renewed in who Jesus is and what he has already done for us. Too many people looking at what other men may do and what other men may say. But Jesus is the one who is the preeminent one who makes a difference in our lives. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 20 through 23. We'll close out this chapter, chapter 2 on tonight. As you read, I want you to think of some questions here. As you, as you study, as we finish out this chapter tonight, I want you to keep in mind these questions. First question, is Christ number one in your life? 
Does Christ have first place in your life? Is Christ number one? Is Christ number one in your life? That's the first question. Is Christ number one? Does he have first place? Does Christ, you can ask that question another way. Does Christ have first place in my life? Is Christ first place in my life? Number two, am I looking for some other spiritual power to get me where I need to be? Am I looking, am I looking for some spiritual power to get me where I need to be? Some other power other than Christ. Am I looking for some other power other than Christ to get me where I need to be? Am I looking? Am I personally, make it personal to you. Am I looking for some spiritual power other than Christ to get me where I need to be? The third question, am I depending on some man-made religious substitute? Am I depending on some man-made religious substitute? Am I, am I personally depending on some other man-made, some man-made religious substitute? Am I depending on some other man-made uh, religious substitute? We want to answer those questions for you tonight, and we want you to answer those questions as we go through these few verses tonight. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 20, and we will end with verse number 23. Paul asked a, a rather lengthy question, a very lengthy question. So I'm going to try to chop it up as it goes from one verse to the other. He asked a very lengthy question, but his questions come back. His question comes right back to the three questions I just gave you. Paul is addressing the church at Colossae, these new converts, these new believers in Jesus Christ. And he's telling them to guard themselves against three things. Chapters 1 and 2 have laid out a defense against these three things. First of all, he says, Guard yourself against legalism. Be on guard against legalism. Today we call legalism uh, tradition. So be on guard. Guard yourself against legalism. Legalism is some religious achievement. It is the religious achievement that men often pride themselves in. It is a religious achievement. It is, it is, thing, it is a thing or practices. And many times it's an Old Testament practice of, of festivals and rules and regulations. So he says, guard yourself against these traditions that you find in the Old Testament where they had festivals for everything. And they were doing good to honor God in those festivals. But he says, guard yourself against legalism. Guard yourself against these traditions. Because men think that salvation, even today, some men think that salvation comes by way of their accomplishments by way of their achievements. Mm -hmm. Paul says, guard yourself yes. against legalism. Mm -hmm. Because salvation does not come based on what you do. It is based on what Christ has already done on Calvary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your salvation is not because you've been so good. Because good enough is not good enough. Good, being very good, will never be good enough to satisfy God. There we get the word 
propitiation. It means the satisfaction that God has. And that satisfaction only comes through Jesus Christ. Yes, God was saying the same song we used to sing. In the day, it wasn't a church song, but we used to sing this song in the day. I can't get no satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You ever sung that song before? I can't get no satisfaction. Terrible English, but the message was clear. I can't get no satisfaction. God was singing the same song. When he looked at Moses, Moses could not give God satisfaction. When he looked at Noah, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they could not give God satisfaction. When he looked at the angels, God could not get satisfied. Only Jesus' death on the cross could satisfy God. Because only Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection could be a substitute for us in our sin. Jesus became the great substitute for us. Jesus the Christ is God's only satisfaction for man's sin. Jesus became the perpetuation for us, or some may say the propitiation for us. He became God's satisfaction. Jesus took our place. We deserve to die. We were too awful to live. But Jesus took our place. We should have been dead and gone. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how long you've been saved. You deserve to die. But God allowed Jesus to become his satisfaction. Oh, yes, he did. He, he allowed Jesus to become. So he says, first of all, God against legalism, against the tra traditions of what I can do, counting the rosary, God against it. Hey, don't depend on the rosary to get you to heaven. Don't depend on the good deeds you do to get you to heaven. He says, first of all, God against legalism. Second thing he says, God against mysticism. Make sure you guard your spiritual life against mysticism. What is mysticism? Mysticism is the pursuit of a deeper or a higher religious experience. <laughs> Talked about it last week and I said to you that people are depending on Trans, transcendental uh, meditation. They're depending on sitting in a Indian style pose and meditating and clearing their minds. Some people are meditating among the crystals, among the rocks. Paul says, you are just, you are just looking in, in pursuit of a deeper or a higher religious experience than the one that Jesus has to offer. Paul says God against that. Amen. Mysticism, it denies all intellect and all rational thinking. It is not rational. It's just not rational. It's, it's just not rational. Mysticism is the statement that says we're round in the corner. That's mysticism. And people are buying down to it. People are really worshiping it. People are really believing it. Mysticism is, is based on something that is not true, that you think is true, but it always relates back to your spiritual experience. It's a deeper pursuit. I told you last week, some people want to make sure they present to you a higher and a deeper pursuit of a religious experience. People talk about experiences that they have. And testimony is good. Uh, talking about the goodness of God is good. But we get to the point in our lives, in our spiritual walks, till we think that we have a higher and a deeper experience, a deeper religious experience than anybody else. 
and we deny those who those who are caught up in mysticism. They deny the intellect and the rational thinking that God has given us. This is really unspiritual. This is carnality at its best. The third thing that Paul says to this church, this 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 new group of converts, he says, "Guard yourself against asceticism." Guard yourself against asceticism because asceticism is a practice of rituals, a rituals, a practice of self-denial. It is a practice of self-denial, of denying yourself from the common things of life in order to prove that you are more spiritual than other folk. Asceticism. It is the denial of oneself, the denial of of oneself. It is the practices of very rigorous self-denial. These are dangerous because you are looking for a higher level of spirituality and it's even higher than Jesus Christ. So Paul says to this church, guard yourself against legalism, guard yourself against uh, asceticism, Guard yourself against mysticism. And he closes out this chapter tonight with all three of these. He talks about it. He says to us tonight, beginning at verse number 20, he's already said that you grow through Christ. You grow and the growth comes from God. He says that in verse number 19, and Jesus Christ has knitted us together. Jesus Christ has created an avenue for us to be nourished through him and him alone. We don't have to go looking for a new religion. I know, I know, I, I know that there are four gospels. There are four gospels, and I don't knock four gospel. I don't knock anybody's denomination. But when we believe in Jesus Christ, we already have the full gospel. When we walk with Jesus, when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, he ushers in, he brings in the full gospel because he is the full gospel himself. Whenever we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're simply talking about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his appearance after he rose from the dead. So he brings in, he brings in, he ushers in what we know to be the full gospel. Paul says in verse number 20, since you're growing in Christ, since you're increasing uh, in Christ, and this increase in Christ, this increase in your spiritual life is from God, he says, therefore. Mm -hmm. He says, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, he says, therefore, if you have died, this word if is since, since you have died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, he asks the question, why? Why as though you're still living in the world? Why as though living in the world do you subject yourself to these regulations? He said, you've been delivered through Jesus Christ. You are growing through Jesus Christ. This growth, this increase is from God. Therefore, you're still acting like you're dead. You are dead in the world when you're really dead in Christ. Look at what it says. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, he meaning we have been delivered, we've been saved from the basic principles of this world. These principles that he's talking about are legalism, asceticism, and mysticism. He's saying you've died from these basic, these are basic principles that anybody will pick up as they go along. I'm saying to you today, be careful that you, so, you don't become so legalistic until the basic principles of life leave you. Don't become so rigid in your belief. Don't become so rigid with your rules and your regulations that folk can't worship in your church. Yes. 
You remember shouting John, don't you? You know, all of us have our own way of worshiping. All of us have our own way of wep 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 welcoming people. And as we welcome people, we have to be sensitive to them. We can't let people be turned off because we're caught up in legalism. If we're giving away food basket, the rule is take one basket per family per car. If you see a car full of people and you have plenty of baskets there, give them two baskets and let them run. <laughs> Don't get so caught up in legalism. When people are hungry, and we know people are hungry during this time. We know people are in need during this time. If people are in need, if people are hungry during this time, don't you run them off. That's right. Because you got structure and you got you got rules and you got regulations and, and you got these legal binding situations that you put people in that you can't think out of the box. Well, we say we're gonna give away food at 12 o'clock. You got here at 1130. You're going to have to wait. I say to you, let them have it and let them run. Present Jesus Christ to them during that period and give them the box and let them go. Practices. Festivals. Because, because you don't wear white on Easter Sunday, you, you should not be here. Because you don't wear yellow or red or white on any given a mission Sunday, you are not seeing in the choir. Don't get so caught up in legalism. Don't get caught up in the rules. Look what Paul says. He says, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Be careful with your regulations. Don't be legalistic until you create regulations. And the phrase now is, we build walls. And that, that wall is to keep people out. God is more concerned about us building bridges than he is about us building walls. Let me tell you, regardless of who the election uh, uh, calls upon today, regardless of who, who wins the election, Walls need to be built in the United States of America, but they don't need to be built against each other. Walls really has no place, but bridges have to be built. You, you, can't, you can't build walls with your allies and between you and your allies, you have to build bridges. And because people don't think like us, because people don't talk like us, because they don't worship like us, because they don't act like us, we're going to put a wall up. That's why many employers are going to diversified training because they want diversified, uh, uh, and a, a group of diversified employees who you love, who you worship, who those things, they don't want you to build a wall up. I want you to make sure that you get out of the legalistic way. And let me just tell you, we may have been saved two weeks, but we, we got some walls built. We, we have accomplished some things. We, we have some things. These regulations that these believers were struggling with were a bunch of rituals, a bunch of, a bunch of occurrences, a bunch of festivals. Paul says... Stop acting like you're still in the world. That's right. He says, why are you subjecting yourself? Why do you subject yourself to regulation? Then he talks about these regulations. Verse number 21. Do not touch. Do not taste. Do not handle. The problem here is, they have more re rules and regulations of what not to do than they have of what to do. God wants us to love. He wants us to show love even when situations are not perfect. We have to learn to love people regardless of what they are or who they are. He says, look, these are the regulations that you have fallen under. 
do not touch, do not eat, do not handle. He says that you've come to the conclusion in verse number 21, Colossians chapter 2, you've come to the conclusion that you put down so many regulations that censor people out, that put up walls between people until you can't reach them. <laughs> he says, he says, you have fallen into rules and regulations that says do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Then he tells you about these regulations. Verse 22 which all concern things which perish with the using. Once they are used, they will perish. Once these things have been used, they will perish. Don't get caught up in your car, your house, your friends. These things will perish. Don't get so caught up in your children, your grandchildren. These things will perish. He's trying to get us to know that Jesus Christ is the one that lasts forever. And the phrase is right. Only what you do for Christ will last. Right. Only what you do for Christ will be counted. Only what you do for Christ will mean anything. Paul says, keep your eyes, keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Don't, don't let these things get you caught up in a spider web. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using. After it's gotten, gotten through being used, it's done. According to the commandments and doctrine of men, and this is a question. I told you it was pretty lengthy. It goes... This one question goes from verse 20 to verse 22. And so what, what he's saying to us is, why are you still acting like it? You caught up in legalism. You caught up in asceticism. You caught up in mysticism. You acting like the world. You acting like you have not met Christ. You acting like the way you used to be in when you were following Judaism. And today, we, we are following worldly characteristics. Let me just share with you. There's a thing called a seeker-sensitive church. And those seeker-sensitive church, and I want to say to you that our church is not a seeker-sensitive church because of the definition of the phrase that a seeker-sensitive church is a church will do anything to get the people in who are seeking. A, single, a, a seeker sensitive church means that we're going to be very sensitive to, to those people who don't know Jesus. And that's what we ought to do. We ought to be sensitive to those who don't know Jesus, but we ought not be so sensitive that we change and become like the world. We ought not. I, I, I went one time. I, I just thought I'd, I'd stop in one time. I went to what they used to have over there off South Main. They used to have what, what was called a Christian nightclub. They used to have a Christian nightclub. And man, I walked in there one time and one time only. I wanted to go see what Christians do in the nightclub. I went in there and they had they had the, the, the mirror ball moving around. They had the flashing red, blue, orange, yellow, and green lights hitting the mirror ball from all different directions. They had the music turned up where you can't hear each other. And people were on the floor dancing just like they were dancing in the club. And I said, now, wait a minute. Now, this is supposed to be a Christian club, but there's nothing that looked like Christianity in here. The women wore what they wore, or wore a lack of what they wore. There was, this was known as a Christian club in Houston. But when I left out of that club, and I, if I walked around the corner to Maxie's or, or to, to some other club, um, it looked the same. It sounded the same. They were acting the same. They dressed the same. What I'm saying to you is, Christians ought to stand out. Yes, Lord. Christians ought to be different. You should not have to tell folk you're Christians. You're not of the world. You're different. When you walk in the room, they ought to know something is different about you. 
They say stuff like, I can't put my hand on it, but some, some different about you. He's saying to us, don't get caught up in our old ways. He draws this analogy here with the Jewish way of living and, and Judaism. And he's trying to pull these, these brand new Christians back into the, the, the limelight of loving Jesus, having Jesus in first place. My first question to you tonight was, is Christ first place in your life? Or are you just blending in? You know, some, some Christians have the lizard mentality. They have lizard personalities. Whatever the lizard get on, he changed the color. Whatever the lizard stop, wherever the lizard stop, if he stop on brown, he turns brown. If he stop on green, he turns green. Christians have to live by Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing, 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 renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. He says that these things go come to an end according to the commandments, according to the doctrine of men. In other words, these doctrines and these commandments were put together by men and not of God. Woo we In our local churches, we have to stop putting together rules and regulations that are not of God. Yes. Making things happen that, that are not of God. Saying that this is the way it ought to be. I thank God that every time somebody shows me the way it ought to be, I say, well, let's look in the Bible and see what the Bible says about it. Yeah. If it's not in the word, then you can't make me abide by that. So he says, leave this legalistic, leave this asceticism and this mysticism alone. He, he says, these things are going to come to pass. These things are going to be shut down. Verse 23, and I'll leave you alone. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. Let me stop there. It has an appearance. It is an appearance of wisdom. It looks right. Everybody else is doing it. It looks right. Everybody else is doing it. Have you noticed on Wednesday night, uh, on Sunday morning, I'm, I'm speaking directly to you. I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm preaching to you. I'm saying the word of God that what God, and hopefully I'm saying it the way God would have me to say it. I, I, I hope that my, my, herm, my hermeneutics is right, and therefore my homiletics ought to be right. Have you noticed not one time do I stop in the middle of my message or in the middle of my teaching and speak in tongues? Uh-uh. Because what happens is, if I'm speaking to you and not to God, then I'm not... I speak to you in tongues. You don't know what I'm saying, but there's some mysticism there. It makes you feel like I'm more spiritual than you are. That's mysticism. If I make you feel, as you say, some kind of way, because I speak in a deeper language than you are, I'm no longer communicating with you. Whenever a person stops speaking English to me, and start speaking in tongues to me, I said to myself, they just left the conversation. They're not talking to me anymore. They're talking to God. They're talking to somebody else. I don't speak that language. And because I don't speak that language, I know that person is not talking to me. Here I am. I'm up speaking. I'm up talking. I'm, I'm up sharing with you. And all of a sudden, I just simply get chance, simply get chance, simply get chance. I wasn't talking to you. Paul says, stop making, letting people feel, make you feel like you, you are enslaved to them or enslaved to the world. You ought not be enslaved to anybody, nor should you be enslaved to this world. We are enslaved through Jesus Christ to God. And let me tell you, if you're not a slave to Jesus Christ, you are a slave to the devil. So what I'm saying to you is, Paul is saying to this church, he's saying to all of us tonight, he is saying, don't get caught up in all this new stuff. 
And don't get caught up in all the old stuff either. <laughs> he says, stick with Jesus. He says, stick with Jesus. Jesus is the one who has brought you. Jesus is the one who's going to take you. And in these terrible times in which we live, we need to understand, regardless if our candidate wins or not, we got Jesus and we still got him. And that's enough. African-Americans, they, they've made it off a little of nothing so long. We, you know, we, we ought not be so, so bent out of shape in this stuff. We ought to understand that, that God has done so much with so little, so long, that if God has to see fit, we can do more with nothing than we can do with something as long as we walking with God. Mm -hmm. it says, verse 23, he says, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. It looked like you're wise. It looked like you're headed somewhere. It looked like you're right. But you, as he says in mysticism, you have left the intelligent way of thinking. Just because you are saved doesn't mean that you ought not have an intelligent way of thinking. <laughs> when you're saved... God takes what you've already brought to the table, so to speak, and he enhances that for his kingdom. When you look at the Apostle Paul, he was enthusiastic in killing Christians because he been, didn't believe in Christianity. But the moment he got saved, what Paul did, he brought the same enthusiasm into this Christian life. He wrote over 75% of the New Testament, and Paul had the zeal of God with the knowledge he did not forget his personality. The problem is people can party, they can dance, and when they get saved, they fold their hands and don't say amen. They want sing. They want praise. One of the soul, trans, soul trained dancers, uh, I forgot her name. One of the soul trained dancers were, has become, has, has been born again. And now she has become one of the greatest praise dancers that I've ever seen. One of the solid gold dancers. I mean, this girl can praise dance because she came out of the world where she, she danced in solid gold. She danced in soul training. And now she's dancing for the Lord. And she has the same zeal, the same enthusiasm. But when it comes to a lot of Christians, they lose their zeal and their enthusiasm. And they just come and sit like a knot on a log before the Lord. Don't you know God uses what you brought to the table? He uses what he put in you in the first place. We ought to have the same zeal. Same with, he says, he said, there's an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religions. This is self-imposed religion. We came up with this ourselves. God didn't give it to us. Paul says to this young church, don't get caught up in self-imposed religion. He says, don't get caught up in false humility. I told you, I told you before, and talk about false humility. You tell a person, you tell a person, you tell a person, oh, man, you sure did do good on that song, or you did do a good job preaching. Say, thank the Lord, praise the Lord or something, or just say thank you or something and move on. But the person that has a false humility, they'll say, well, you know, I try. That's a false sense of humility. It's a false sense of humility because they in themselves, they're saying that they in themselves are trying. It's not God that gives them the strength and gives them the power. When God gives you the strength, when God gives you the anointing, when God gives you the power, you don't try to put it on yourself and show yourself as a, a, a humble person. You say, thank the Lord. Praise God. To God be the glory. Many people say, oh, well, you know, I'm just trying. I'm just, you know, they, they want to paint a picture that they're, they're humble with it. But it's a false sense of humility. And he says, in, the, in neglect of the body. Remember, he talked about do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. They thought that because they neglect their body, that salvation was present and sanctification was on their bucket list. They thought that because they neglect their bodies, 
they thought because they neglect their body. I'm not talking about fasting. When you fast, that means you, you neglect some of the things that you really would normally eat or really would normally drink or really would normally do for the sake of getting a closer connection with God. Our nation needs to be in prayer and in fasting. Our nation right now needs to be in prayer and fasting right now. Because, you know, regardless of who becomes president, we are in a bad way. And if in the morning we have a new president, he and she is going to grab a hold to a tiger that they ain't going to be able to handle right away. Our nation is so divided and so messed up now, I would not dare want to follow this president. We have to get to a point where we need to call for a fast, we need to call for prayer, and we need to constantly pray and lift up our leaders, lift up our nation, because Jesus and Jesus alone is going to be the one that straighten it out. That's right. So we, we neglecting our bodies. They neglected their bodies. Oftentimes when those who worship idol gods, they would cut themselves with stones. Because they believed that cutting themselves with stone would, would be a sacrifice before God. The ultimate sacrifice has already been given. It was given over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. Amen. He was the only satisfaction for, for God. Jesus was himself. Yes. He says, but are of no value against the indulgence of flesh. He says to us tonight, this legalism, this asceticism, this mysticism is no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Our flesh, our, our sin nature loves to sin. Our sin nature looks forward to sinning. Our sin nature remember when we were not saved in our sin nature, want to call those memories up. Matter of fact, we got it on tape. Matter of fact, we got it on video. Matter of fact, we got it on DVD and CD. And our sin nature loves the sin that we used to hang out with. And because our sin nature loves the sin, we don't need these things like neglecting the body. We don't need this self-imposed religion. We don't need this false humility because we need Jesus because none of that will take away the indulgence of the flesh. It takes Jesus. I ask you that question. The question is, is Christ Jesus in first place in your life? Are you drawing from another power other than Jesus? Are you depending on some other man-made religious substitute other than Jesus? I stop by to tell you tonight that Jesus became the ultimate substitute. Jesus the Christ is the only true and living substitute. It was Jesus Jesus the Christ, who died on a skull hill called Calvary. He was the only satisfaction for our God. He's the only one who can sanctify us. He, Jesus, was the atonement for all mankind. He, Jesus, was the sacrificial lamb over 2,000 years ago. That's why nobody has to, has to go to hell. You, if you're listening to me today, you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to die and lift your eyes in hell. Just believe the story today. Jesus has become the ultimate sacrifice. Amen. He died over 2,000 years ago. They hung him. They, they stressed him. They dropped him. He died on a skull hill called Calvary. He gave up the ghost that day. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. But early that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He was, the, he was the substitute. He was the ideal substitute for our sin. He was the substitute for us. He took our place. We deserve to die, but Jesus took our place. Paul says to this, these new converts, he said, whatever you do, leave legalism out of it. Leave mysticism alone. 
and asceticism, get rid of it. You need to understand that you have Jesus, and if you don't have him, this is your opportunity today. The door, the door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus, just as you are. You don't have to go and get it right, because you can't get it right. But you need to give it to Jesus, and he will give it right, get it right. If you're, you're not saved, and for some reason or the other, you have not been given the opportunity to come to Christ, this is your moment. You can get to know him right here, right now. All you have to do is confess Christ as your Savior. The door is open. The invitation is extended. You don't have to wait till we get back in church. You can confess Christ as your Savior right here, right now. Be born again. Guarantee that you're going to heaven. Jesus gave his life for you. If you want to invite him into your life, just repeat after me. I want to lead you in this simple prayer. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for your, my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe that you are now born again. We believe if you prayed this prayer honestly, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you are saved. You're on your way to heaven. Make sure you get involved in a good Bible teaching church. And if you don't have a church home, or you're in between church homes, or are you looking for a church home, or even if you wasn't looking and you know you need a church home, I recommend New Beginning Church. Where Jesus is the captain of the ship, where Jesus is the main attraction, where Jesus is the center of attention. If you want to join our church, you can do so by inboxing me and let me know that you want to join. And we'll be glad to welcome you to the family of faith. If you've received Jesus Christ as your savior tonight, I want to know about it so we can rejoice with you. Just inbox me and let me know you received Jesus Christ. So we can throw a block party as they do in heaven and, and, and celebrate you in your newfound faith in Christ. If you need prayer, inbox me and let me know. Many have inboxed, many have emailed, and uh, they have had prayer with us and we've had prayer with them. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, for being a part of our service. Uh, we're looking forward to opening up next week with Colossians chapter 3. Please, ma'am, please, sir, read all of Colossians chapter 3. And if you have not been faithfully reading the book of Colossians, go ahead and read chapters 1, 2, and 3. Come on up to chapter 3 so you can get a good picture of what Jesus is doing in Colossians chapter two, chapter 1, 2, and 3. This is a very powerful study. It paints a vivid picture of who Jesus is and what he has done for us over 2,000 years ago. Now it is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. We're going to ask our, our members to give uh, their tithes and offerings on tonight. Go ahead and, and give your tithes and offering on tonight. Don't wait to Sunday to give. Uh, you can give by three means, and we'll ask our business just to give an offering if you would. If you don't have a church home, it's okay to give a tithe then an offering. Uh, you have three means of giving. You can give by Cash App. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. I like to say dollar sign NBC Souls. It's our cash app. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com Zelle, our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com or you can give by P.O. Box our P.O. Box is 503 Missouri City, Texas 77 
459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. We'd be glad to hear from you financially. We'd be glad to record uh, uh, your gift and uh, give you a slip of what you have given at the end of this year. I want you also to join us for our Sunday school every Sunday on Facebook Live. Uh, join us every Sunday on Facebook Live at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. Very powerful Sunday school teachers will be waiting to greet you at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning for our Sunday school. And also at 1045 a.m. for our worship service. 1045 a.m. every Sunday for our worship service right here on Facebook Live. And also, thank you for joining us tonight for our regular Bible study, which is every Wednesday at 720 p.m. Please continue to join us. We're looking forward to, to hearing from you, seeing you, and you reacting to us, and us reacting to you. Amen, and thank the name of Jesus. I pray that everybody has voted already. I pray that you've already voted. You have voted, and uh, your vote has been counted or is being counted. I pray that you voted. Now that we've voted, it's time to pray. <laughs> we, I told you uh, several months ago, up until the very date, we need to do two things. We need to pray and we need to vote. Then we need to pray. We need to pray and we need to vote. And now we need to pray. We need to pray and ask the Lord for favor, ask the Lord to bless our nation and to bless this entire world. So we need to be lifting Jesus Christ and, and prayer and lifting our nation in prayer. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing who the president is. But even if your candidate didn't win, just remember, Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus is still in control. And if Jesus is in control, he's making the difference that no man will ever make. Just remember, don't get caught up in legalism. Don't get caught up in asceticism. And don't get caught up in mysticism. Get caught up in Jesus and Jesus alone. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you again, Father God, for blessing us. We thank you for hearing from us and blessing us to hear from you. We ask you to bless us now. Keep us in your will and your way. Bless our lives and bless us to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Here at the New Beginnings Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Praise God for John chapter 12, verse 32. Bless you, keep you, is our prayer. Be blessed.